In this week's episode, we got to sit down with the world-renowned Jewish singer, Benny Friedman. Benny Friedman, who you guys probably know. If not, that means you're not one of the 17 million people who watched Ivri Anaychi on YouTube. He has millions of views. Millions of people around the world know him. He has traveled the world and continues to travel the world, singing by weddings, concerts. And nowadays, or whenever you're listening to this, this was during the quarantine corona period, doing Zoom concerts and Zoom bar mitzvahs and Zoom weddings. He um, has a lot of experience, and he got to tell us about some of his stories, some of his struggles that he had to go through, and what it means to be a Jewish singer and the impact he has on so many people. And he also sang by my wedding, unrelated. You don't need to know that fact, but now you do. And Benny is actually one of 14. His uncle is Avram Fried. There's so much you can get from this episode. Cousins are eighth day. His cousins are eighth day. Uh, one of his cousins There's a lot of yuchas there. So, yeah. and his father is Ramana Sreeman, a bit, huge rabbi who also gets millions of views on YouTube on a lot of his stuff. So this is a loaded episode. If you do know Benny Freeman, um, you'll appreciate the depth of, of you know, of where we go with him and, and what we talk about. And if you don't know him, then enjoy finding out more about him. Welcome to the Meaningful People Podcast, the podcast where we talk to people who are... Meaningful. Yeah, that sounds good. We are here this afternoon with the one and only Benny Friedman. Benny, thanks so much for coming over here. My pleasure. We, we know, L'chaim to you. We know you're a, a very busy person um, in general, so we appreciate you coming over here. Um, currently, we know you live in Crown Heights. That and your exact correct. address is, no, I'm not going to say your exact address, yeah. but uh, you're not originally from there. Where, can you tell us a little about where you're from? I'm originally from Minnesota, Twin Cities, Minnesota. St. Paul, Minnesota. St. Paul, Minnesota. Is it, do, you, do you like identify as like a Minnesota boy? I sure do. Yeah? Absolutely. Um, I do not identify as a New Yorker, that's for sure. <laughs> Although my driving has deteriorated. <laughs> I was telling Yaakov how uh, I've been with you in the past where so many people just come over to you in public, and no matter what you're doing, no matter where you are. And I, and I say you're just so receptive to them. So when we're going through our notes, Yaakov was like, well, he's from Minnesota. He's not a New Yorker. <laughs> no, again, Minnesota, oh man, you're just ostracizing polite. all our New York people. New York people, New York people, you. it's not ostracizing. They know what it's about. It's <laughs> they know true. what it is. It's true. Um, do you, I, was, I went into uh, one of these like corner markets you know they mm -hmm. have in uh, brooklyn i wanted to use the uh the atm and i took out some money and i and i left and as i was leaving i said to the guy behind the counter i said thank you and he goes what i did you a favor okay. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. okay sorry that's so funny. Um, it, it, it's funny that Nachi mentioned that I have seen you by weddings and something very beautiful. I do see you interacting with everyone while not every singer. I know they're very busy during that time, but you try to give everyone, make them feel like someone's special. Is that something you work on? Does that come natural? It doesn't, no, it, it's not something I work on. It's called deflecting the attention. If you're nervous to be, uh, let's say, to be on, on the microphone, right. uh, one easy trick is to deflect the attention to somebody else, right? So if um, if all the bobbies are standing watching, and they're and you're a little uncomfortable with it, if you suddenly give attention to the anical, suddenly the attention shifts away from you. Mm. So it's like a a coping mechanism. Oh, it's so like a survival mean, tactic. You're not even a nice guy. You're not saying. even a nice guy. No, it's can't give that credit. tactical. But you, you get you get nervous before, let's say, weddings. Hope was, you do actually get nervous still. Uh, sometimes it depends. It depends what the situation is. If I'm singing new material, like you know, there's a there's a minig that has taken off where people s you know, choose the songs that they want for their chuppah, and so often it's songs that I I don't know. So That's they want the me to learn. <laughs> yeah, they want me to learn the song, and then to sing it with different with the miad or mi bon siach, right? So right. it's not even the words that I just just yesterday learned the song right. to these words and I gotta switch it. So I have to know the tune as uh, well anyway, so when when there's that going on, it's very nerve wracking because I'm usually pretty sure that it's not gonna go well. So, so you're saying anyone listening who's who's gonna get married and they're gonna have you sing by the wedding, you wanna sing the tune of Horashah to Exactly the, down the one song that I down. know, let's just go with that. Okay. <laughs> That's very fair. Um, so going back to, to Minnesota a little, um, I, I'm going to assume that you guys were there because your father was doing shlichus there. Is that sure. why you were located Absolutely. there? Absolutely. 
And um, you're one of 14 children? Yeah. What was that like? I mean, it's, a lot of people are, I'm one of four, and Nahi's one of six. Six. What's one of 14 well, like? I'm, I'm, I'm number 11. Hmm. Now you know how to. So I'm, wow. I, I don't know anything about small families. So I wouldn't be able to compare it to anything. For me, it was normal. You know, uh, house is always full. Did you guys have a minion? You have have ten ten boys? Ten boys. That's the way to do it. That's awesome. Did you make the minion? No. No, 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 the youngest is a boy. Um, Like in quarantine, we didn't have a problem, right? Mm. (laughs) (laughs) Wait, no. Um, But, you know, there's this thing where where you have a family of four. If there's only four of us at home, right, let's say for Shabbos, the consensus is nobody's home, right? Everyone's gone. It's only it's only us, right? Right. Where in some families that's everybody. Yeah. By us, that's nobody's home. Mm. Um, but that's how it how it uh, like that famous story that they say that there was a young uh, poor folk. They were deciding if they want to get married, but they couldn't agree because she wanted a big family, and he wanted a small family, <laughs> right? And they couldn't agree. Uh, then it turns out she wanted a big family. Uh, because she uh, she was in a family of of two kids, she wanted right. you know eight children, a big family. He was from a family of sixteen. Hmm. And he wanted a small family, eight children. And really, if they would have talked out the numbers, they would have found out that they wanted the same thing. <laughs> um, I, my family, it's a fun it's a fun time at home. It's a, uh, today when we get together, which you know happens once in a while, it's a great party. It's a lot of fun. And uh, it's a great resource if you need, you know, you have a question about something, you go on a family chat and there's like, everyone like has Wikipedia. their own area of expertise. <laughs> sure, it's like a whole panel. Uh, Bar Hashem, look, I, I highly recommend it. <laughs> it's, uh, okay. it's very sweet. It's how many, how many kids do you have as of now? I have four kids. Can okay, I go we're, we're, we're getting slowly, there. Slowly, slowly. <laughs> In the right time. So um, legend has it that your father... Um, had a lot to do with a lot of different people, but someone in particular that I heard was Bob Dylan. Bob Dylan, that's who right. I always mixed up with Bob Marley, but totally different. They are people. not the same. I right? know. I was gonna say, like, <laughs> I, I like remember, I don't say Bob Marley because that's not, not the same. who. So Bob Dylan, he had he had what to do with him. Yeah, oh. yeah. For a while, he was. Uh, he, uh, my father was his teacher, I guess, his, his rabbi. Uh, for a while, he was very, very interested actively inter- interested in learning about Yiddishkeit. Um, he's, still, he's still very Jewish. I just don't know today how, how active he is about uh, learning about Yiddishkeit. I, ju- I just don't know. But for a while, he was uh, very active, and, he w- and my father was his, was his go-to guy. Um, many stories they had together. One in particular, my father was once putting on tefillin with him, and you wrap around the strap around your arm seven times, so my father says, Al Picabola, the seventh time around represents the world of Malchus. Malchus is speech. What does that mean? What's the, what's the significance of speech? My father says to Bob Dylan, sometimes you can have a guy who not necessarily is, is smarter than everybody else, not necessarily, you know, but for some reason, when he talks people listen and such a person has to be very very careful what they say hmm. and, my, and Bob Dylan goes I hear you you know you got the point wow that's heavy <laughs> it's not that heavy I know it's a little heavy so you, well it's uh, only heavy if when you talk people listen right it's true. Yeah. <laughs> so you uh, are obviously in the music world you know most okay. people who are listening know that that's what you do um, what type of music did you listen to growing up what were, what were you into um, I was very into Avram Freed. Stranger, yeah. Perhaps you have heard of him. He was uh, number one in our house. For those who don't know, he's, he's your uncle. My father's brother. He's your father's bro. Wow. Um, so he was big deal. Whenever uh, Avram Freed record or tape or whatever it was at the time came out, it was a big simcha in the house. <laughs> you know, we would wait for our copy to show up in the mail and it was a yomtev. Mm. Um, but uh, music was uh, music. Uh, music was always in the house. Um, Mordechai ben David, London School of Jewish Song, Silva Zemmer, Diaspora Yeshiva Band. Wow. I mean, everybody. We we had, we had a lot of music. 
And thank God, I, 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 being that I'm on the bottom of the family, right? So the music that was very popular and very uh, uh, was always being played in the house was the music that my older brothers and sisters enjoyed. So mm-hmm. I, I got like a lot from the 70s, <laughs> even though I wasn't born, you know. Um, yeah, we had a lot of music, a lot of singing. We used to sit around and sing a lot. Yeah, it was a very uh, so music was a big you, part. You got some intel now about Uncle. Oh uncle, yeah, Uncle so, Singer. So I I spoke to your brother before, and he told me that you guys would interchange the word Uncle and Singer when you were younger. That you didn't know the <laughs> difference between it because your uncle Avram Fried, the singer Avram uh-huh. Fried, you thought the word Uncle and Singer was the same. Is that accurate? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. For a while, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, we didn't know we had any other uncles. It was just that one uncle uh, when we were small. Uh, he was the he was the most famous one, and we had videos of him and tapes of him, and he was the uncle. Later, we found out that uh, an uncle means you know all those other people who are in the family. But there's no question he he was a big influence. Um, what what I, I, I'm trying to put myself in your shoes. I'm trying to. I'm not sure. Is it a bigger advantage or disadvantage that your uncle's Avram Freed? I, I hear both sides to it, and I, I'm curious for you personally. Is it? I maybe. It's like, is, is it daunting? Yeah, is it daunting? Like Avram Freed. Is it daunting? I mean, it's certainly a a, a huge benefit. It's certainly a, how so? The, how so? I, I think. Well, first of all, before anything, it's the idea. I, I mean, it. Growing up with an uncle who's who's a Hasidic singer makes it, in my mind at least, extremely attainable and and doable. Right? It's not like some guy who exists far far away in a in a in a what it called in a in a galaxy far far away, right. where it's it's something that's you you could only imagine. You, you, know, you no, it must. My father's little brother became a singer, so it's something that you can do if you if you do it. You can. You, so that's first of all. Um, second of all, you can call him up and ask him for advice or for help. And uh, it's a, he's a great resource, obviously. And he's a great connection. Um, the, the downside is, is basically non-existent. I mean, what, people compare you to Avram Fried. That's uh, stupidity. <laughs> I mean, Avram Fried is, is super great. Avram Fried is, uh, I mean, I can go on and on and on about him. Um, he's doing it for 40 years. So we, comp- I mean, whatever. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it might be a, a downside, but it's a, it's not a real downside because you, I mean, it's just not, there's not, there's no comparison. There's nothing to compare. So from that side, I trust to disregard it. Do, do you see that happening in the music world that people try being someone else and they're not tapping into like themselves enough? Like, do you think that's... A- no, I don't think it's a problem. I think, I think the way you, you discover yourself is by mimicking your heroes. Mm. I think that's the way to do it. And that goes in just more than just music. That's in just any, everything. In every way. In anything in life. You look up to somebody, you try to... Uh, copy you know th- those things about them that you uh, admire and eventually it becomes you wow i think that i, I and i was doing that consciously and, and singing wise for i i spoke about this when the last time i was here um i took a two-year break from listening to avram fried music because when i listen to him i i sing like him just you know not even consciously I took a break from listening to him sing, and I tried to consume a lot of other music to try to pick up Bob Dylan nuances. Not Bob Dylan. <laughs> I don't know Bob Dylan for, okay. from a, from a singing side is not my greatest hero. Um, so you stopped listening for two years and to, to, to try to pick up sponge you know, different. Yeah, exactly, exactly to try to pick up uh, you know shtickus from other people and make a collection. Once you have. The collection that you put together from your favorite people, that's you. It's, it's funny you say that because uh, I heard, um, I don't know the exact name, it's from Tzvi Silverstein, that you were working on your album and you were, you did a lot, you did most of it. Yeah. Could, could you tell us about your experience there, what happened? 
it, it, it's, I mean, it's, it's, so basically what happened like this. When I first went into the studio, my f- the first CD, the first recording, the first time ever, I told myself, I'm going to go in the studio and I'm going to rely and trust the people who are with me in the studio that they are going to tell me when, the, when my singing is, is good enough. Because if, if, I'm gonna, if I'm going to judge it by myself, we're, we'll never finish. I'll Why never is that? Be, it, I'll never be satisfied. You'll always be like, I could do better, I could do better? I could do better because like we, I'll, I'll be comparing myself to Avram Fried. Right. I, if Avram Fried was doing this, it would be much better. Mm. I said, that's it. I'm going to sing. And as soon as you guys tell me, we got it, that's it. I'm, I'm, I'll, I'm happy. Um, and that's how I went for like 10 years. Tzvi Silberstein uh, came to a concert in Memphis. It was in, in conjunction with a bas mitzvah of a cousin of his. And they threw a concert for the, for the bas mitzvah. So he was there for the show. The, the, the show was Matzi Shabbos. Um, after the show, Tzvi came over to me and said, something is very wrong over here <laughs> because I've listened to your albums. And, and you know, I, you, did you know who he is, or I, I knew who he was. Oh, okay, because I'm, I'm imagining a random guy like no, no, something's really was. wrong going yeah. on over here. Did, did like, you understand what he was talking about right when, right when he said that, or you? Were... I understood exactly what he was saying right when he said it. How'd that feel? Did you have like a pit in your stomach? And where, where were you at? Yeah, th- that. And where were you at with your your current album that you were in the middle of recording? I was very deep into it. I was very deep into it, but I, but n- nothing changed right after that conversation. He told me. We're gonna have to change it, and then I said, "Sounds good to me." And then that was it. <laughs> right. I went back home. He went back home, and and a few weeks later, or months later, I'm not sure, he called me and said he wants to, to record a duet with me, and he wants to do it, he, and he wants me to come with him to Donny Gross and record it there. And I'd never been, the, I never, I never worked with Donny Gross before, and I said, uh, "I don't know." And he said, "Come, record by him, and I guarantee you." You will love it, and you'll never want to leave. And I went there, and we recorded that duet. It hasn't come out yet. Um, and it was just a whole different experience. They both, they, they were like, we are going to, to take the, your, your voice, your instrument, or whatever you want to call it, and we're going to squeeze the last drops out of it. And we are not going to be satisfied until we have the best outcome that we can get. And it was just, it was you, just, it was different. Did you feel a difference? Because I do like, I hear a difference in your last album, yeah. To your other albums, you are, you did take it to another level. But why, why, like, what turned on? Like, what happened that said, okay, now it's, I, I I'm not sure. I'm, I'm, I had nothing turned on. It was, it was just a, a change of focus. The focus was until now. It was, do we have? A good enough vocal, like let's say you, you, you run through the song four times or five times and, mm-hmm. you, and you punch here and you punch there. Okay, do I have enough to work with, let's say the, the guy who has to edit now and go, go in and choose the best vocal and cut and paste. Do I have enough good stuff here to work with to get a, a, a good vocal for the final product? That was how I, how I did business for 10 years. With Donnie and Svi, they said, no, no such thing as good enough. Nobody came into the studio to do good enough. We are going to get the best that we can get. And if it takes us two hours, it'll take us two hours. It takes us six hours, it'll take us six hours. We're not leaving here until we get the best result. And it has to do with, with the key of the song. This is a very ma- a major key. <laughs> ah, hmm. Major key for any uh, singers who are listening. What I, what, I, what I had done in the past was, even though in my mind I knew it was wrong, if I'm singing a song in the studio and it's too and and my voice is 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 struggling, right? I'm straining. The first instinct is, it's too high. I have to take the key down. And we and we did that many times. Even like songs that went on my albums, it's oh, too high. Take it down. Donny Gross says, don't take it down. Take it up, because what's happening is, your voice has a bridge. 
there are bridge notes in the range. Here, your voice is open, 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 beautiful. Everything's happening fine. And then uh, up here, there's, there's a weiter open. And in the middle, there are bridge notes where your voice, you're switching from chest voice to head voice. The middle notes between are the, are the hardest notes to sing in. And many times what happens is you're singing a song and you're right in the bridge. So you're struggling. And the easiest solution is take Quit. it up. Yeah. The, the, most people think, take it down, It'll make it easier. You're, you're, it's too high. Not too high. It's the wrong notes. It's take it lesson. up. It's a great and, lesson in life. I yes. say, I'm saying, like, what's the nimshal here? I'm yeah. trying yeah. to, like, well, like, how could we apply that to... Lichat chila riber. Not lichat chila runter. Go higher. So that was, uh, I mean, and a few songs that we had recorded for the CD. We took them up, like, plus four. You know what I mean? So like, you had to redo them. Yeah. Totally redo them. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. you you push yourself to a level you never thought you could possibly even go yeah. to. Wow, that's cool. And I had heard for years comments where people, you know, my brother, my sister would tell me, "I heard you at the Chasana, whatever. Like, why can't you sound like that on your CD?" And I said, "Of course. I mean, the Chasana. You know what I mean? I'm singing for four hours in the studio. I I drive for an hour, get out the car, and, and go sing. You know, my voice is not." And 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 it bothered me always. Like, if I would put in a little effort, I could do it. Anyway, Donnie and Tzvi finally pushed me to put in that, that effort. That's really interesting. They guided me along. So, I mean, as of today, I think you're, you're the most popular Jewish music video on YouTube. Is that oh, accurate? Yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, Do you know, is, there any, is there any more? I don't know. I think it's the 17 million views it has. 17 million views. And it's not so far off. Obviously, you have amazing talent and... We love all the stuff you do, but your father also is super popular on YouTube. Yeah. No, your father <laughs> is the most popular YouTube rabbi. Right. Uh, there's got to be a yeah. connection there in some way. You guys are putting out goodness to the world. Well, we both have this one guy in India. <laughs> 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 um, it's interesting. I don't know. How's that? How's that? Fe- I'm curious how that feels. That like. You know, you know, Baruch Hashem, Nachi and I, we're making an impact on, on the Jewish world, you know, somewhat. 17 million people, like, what does that feel for you? Like, it's crazy. Um, I, I, I don't know how YouTube... Uh, the counts. algorithm. I, I, yeah, I don't know what the algorithm, I don't know what they count as a view. I'm not sure if it's 17 individual people. I don't know. It's that one family in Brooklyn that clicked it. Right. I, I, I don't know. That goes by every computer or each sure. device, I think. Uh, but what, one. Just, once? Yeah. It counts only one time that that device watches the video forever. I, I don't know. I don't know. That's I don't crazy. want to say the wrong answer. <laughs> That's crazy because the numbers are climbing, even today. There's a lot of people in the world. Yeah, but you think people are seeing it for the first time today. Yeah, for sure. I, I meant a I'll lot of people you. saw it already, but there's. You you know you you work on something, and you put it out into the world, and then and then it just it it does what it does, and you have and you have no idea, you have no control, and you and you. You're not aware, and it's just doing what it's doing. I, I'll tell you a quick story. Um, we moved, I live like in the Lower East Side now of Crown Heights, near near the hospital, if you know that. Anyway, so there's a new, uh, shul uh, that opened up on the corner where I live, Baruch Hashem, after we bought the house, they opened a shul, nice. I'm just on the corner, it was beautiful. Anyway, Shabbos in the morning, I show up to shul, and I see there's a guy sitting there who is obviously not from Crown Heights, not from the community, I'd never seen him there before. Um, and uh, he's wearing like a, a big bright talus, like a very, it was very easy to spot him and very easy to know that he's not from here. And Garnish, whatever, he was on the other side of Shul. I was in my corner. I saw him and I noticed him and then I, you know, I uh, davened and everything. After davening, I'm in the hallway outside and he's there and he tells me, he asked me if I, if, can I talk to you for a second? I said, Sure. So he says, let me tell you something. Um, this week, Wednesday, this happened a few months ago, maybe half a year ago. Um, he says on Wednesday, his wife ended up in the hospital. Something crazy happened and she's in the hospital, like a total shock, a total surprise. And his children are by neighbors. Uh, and he says sitting there in the hospital Friday night and he's completely lost, right? His head is spinning and and he's depressed and he doesn't know. Anyway, 
Shabbos in the morning, he says, let me, let me, let me get out of this hospital and, and look for a shul, the Shabbos. So he walks out and he doesn't know the neighborhood, he doesn't know the place. And he's wandering around trying to find a shul. Finally, he sees a, a from looking guy and he asks him where's a shul. He comes in like a hole in the wall shul. It's not a big, beautiful uh, synagogue. It's a storefront. It didn't even have a sign on the front. So I came in here. He says, I sit down. I don't know anybody. He says, and I just finally had some time to think. And I'll be honest with you. Shabbos, you're not supposed to be sad. But uh, I couldn't help it. I was just... I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking to myself, what happened to my life? What happened? How did I end up here? What's going to be my future? What's going to be the future of my family? Can my wife, can my wife survive? Can she get better? What, where are my children? They're far, they're by strangers. I like just everything was, he says, I'll be honest with you. I thought to myself, Hashem abandoned me. Just abandoned me. That was my feeling. And then I looked up, and what do I see? Yesh tikva. He says these words, you walked into shul, and I knew that Hashem did not forget about me. Where do you, where do you see yesh tikva? When I walked in, oh, he saw your face. He, he saw, saw you. my face. Oh, I thought you saw like a banner. I'm like, yeah. what is he saying? Oh, <laughs> he, he saw Benny Friedman. Yesh tikva. Ah. He didn't see me. Right. I saw the song that I recorded wow. ten, uh, eight years ago. I said, I started, I started shaking. I gave him a big hug, wow. and and a few weeks later, he saw the rabbi of the shul. They were in a Borough Park, and he saw him in a restaurant. And he went over to me. Oh, thank you so much for everything that your shul did for for me and my family. And the rabbi didn't know what he was talking about. <laughs> oh, he like. So I thought about that story for a long time, like this idea where you you put something out. And it goes, and it goes, and it goes, and it doesn't tell you where it goes, and you don't know, you don't know who comes in contact with it, you don't know who's inspired by it, you don't know whose life has changed by it, and, uh, and that's it. I mean, you have uh, a video that you put on YouTube, and you go, and whatever, and you go eat lunch, and it's moving. Right. So it's incredible. I mean, it's, it's for, for a big responsibility what you put out. Be careful what you put out. Hopefully, it's good stuff. And second of all, uh, yeah, keep 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 putting stuff out because I mean, today especially we, we, when we when we find out that the world is so small, so it's so uh, possible to reach an incredible amount of people. So I kind of want to start an organization with you and just put you in places where people are having a tough time. They'll be like, and see what happens. Up. Yeah. And then all of a sudden it's like, boom, <laughs> inspire so many people. <laughs> you know, my, my cousin, Shmuley Marcus, yeah. he, he, he always says, we got to force the Ashkocha Pratis. Nice. <laughs> yeah. You can't stay home and expect <laughs> Ashkocha Pratis. You got to go out there and force the Ashkocha Pratis. I like that. Um, so you, you were just talking about, obviously, uh, there's a success there that you put something out and it goes somewhere. Could you, do you know, the, like the biggest mistake or the biggest failure that you've attempted and it just didn't work? Because people, I, I know it, like, yeah. I mean, you have a long journey and struggles and hours of work, but people just see the good that comes out. They like, see the oh, finished product. 17 million. It was easy probably to put that up, you know, it's like. I'm curious what what's the biggest struggle that you've had, the biggest mistake. The well, I don't know what the biggest mistake. Um, and even if I did, I, I would probably be too embarrassed to to talk about it. Oh, it's that big? I, I don't know. <laughs> no, no, okay, okay. I don't know. But one thing that I regret is that in this song that has 17 million views, I say, "Bnei Avraham Yitzchak v'Yakov, Bnei Sarah Rivka Rachel v'Leia," and I took that. From actually, the Rebbe said it at the end of one of the uh, Lag Boimer parades. Rabbi Hecht, who was the MC, thanked all the organizers and all the organizations and all the whatever, the counselors and the teachers and everybody. And then the Rebbe went back to the microphone. I, you know, he was getting ready to leave, and he went back to the microphone, and the Rebbe said, and especially the children, the boys and the girls, B'nai Avraham, Yitzchak, V'Yakov, B'nois, Sara, Rivka, Rochel, Vileya. Mm. And I said, B'nai Sarah Rivka Rochel And uh, because in my, I didn't go back to look. 
what did I be said? I just went from my memory, and for some reason it was in my head, B'nai Sarifka. And that's how we recorded it. And then after it came out, I, I somebody pointed out. Not that many, people, not that many people saw it, don't worry. No, but, <laughs> oh, it bothers me till this day. Oh, man. Okay, I guess the, you, you're publicly apologizing to the Venus yeah. right now. And then also, uh, I publicly apologize. I, I'm doing a lot of these Zoom meetings for the Russian community now that Kharasho came out. And I always, whenever I get on, I apologize to them. Because for some reason, in my style of singing, I put a lot of round uh, sounds on the end of words. Uh, Can you give an example? I, I don't know what you mean. Like, what's an like example? Like, instead of saying, Koel Sasa and Koel Simcha, I'll say Koel Sasa and Koel Simcha. Ah. Just because, you know, in a certain range in the voice, it's uh, easier for me like that. Anyway, um, I sang Kharasho. A lot of the, a lot of the, the song, I'm saying Kharasho instead of Kharasho. Ah. And unforgivable. And, yeah, it is unforgivable. If you speak Russian, yeah, it's unforgivable. Nafi, yeah, if it's, it's, it's imagine he was pronunciating, I'm trying to do it incorrectly, like each syllable, it's, yeah. it sounds a little off. Yeah, I know. I heard kids, Russian kids go, Manja Kharasho. 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 Um, and, t- and, and kids in, in New York will come on my favorite song, Harasho. And every time it breaks my heart. <laughs> oh, man. So you, you get stopped a lot of places when you go and you could possibly be with your wife, your kids. Does it ever get too much? Do you ever like uh, think like, hey, I wish this wasn't happening? I wish people weren't coming over to me constantly? Or I, I always try to think the alternative is way worse. <laughs> Could you imagine if I would go out and nobody recognized me and nobody wanted to talk to me and nobody wanted to take my picture? That would be much worse. That would be the ultimate failure. Um, this is, sometimes it gets overwhelming, but it's the better, uh, it's the better option. That's for sure. That's very, this is a very good Alec. Like how, how's it like for, you know, your wife or your family? I mean, obviously there's always, it, it comes as a unit. How does, how does like your wife deal with all of this? Because you're a popular guy. You're she moving takes around. it mostly in very good humor, you know? Um, we were, we, 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 we've been going to Eretz Yisrael for Sukkot for the last few years. And, we, you know, you, in, in Yerushalayim, you go to someone's house for the meal, you could be walking, you know, an hour. So we have these strollers and we're pushing and, sh- and schwitzing and this. And sometimes I would be... Uh, let's say 20 feet ahead of her she's walking with my niece and the other kids and I'm pushing a stroller so I'm trying to go a little faster and the way it would work is she, my niece actually pointed it out my niece says in a certain neighborhood my niece says oh we're entering the murmur zone where <laughs> we would we would walk and I would we, uh, you know pass a group of, of uh, you know American Bachram or whatever and they not knowing that this is my wife 20 feet behind would wait till I was not within earshot, and then they would start murmuring about me. And my wife would hear it, and my niece would hear it, and they always like, oh, we're in the murmur zone, because <laughs> where everyone's murmuring about this guy with it. And she's, uh, you know, she's, she's got good, a good attitude about it. It's not always easy. Um, it's not always easy. Uh, which, part, which part specifically is hard? Um, it's not easy sharing your... Um, I, I mean, it's probably not that different from anybody who has a job. Um, it's just, it seems like I'm much more available than I actually am. And both ways, like it seems, it, it would seem, if I'm not working, like today, I mean, we're all home in confinement and uh, I'm, I'm 100% available to my, to my family. But I'm also getting like hundreds of, of requests for videos and Zooms and this and uh, and so if I'll, if I'll take, you know, five minutes to go on a, on a Zoom call when I should be, like everybody else, just available, it's like, you know, it's, you're, you're unexpectedly suddenly unavailable. And uh, the same thing with the other side, like, can you, do, can you give me a 30-second video? Like, I'm just not available. Hey, whatever. So You're it, getting pulled in, in a lot of directions. Yeah, yeah. Getting pulled in a lot of directions when, when each person from that direction is thinking to themselves, what am I asking you to do already? <laughs> right. right. For, for them, it's just 30 it's seconds. Nothing. It's mom's nothing. <laughs> for them, it's 30 seconds. For you, it's like, this is the hundredth time yeah. someone wants 30 seconds of me. Right. And, and just, I need it to be quiet, right? right. You know, I can't do a video for you when my, when my baby's screaming and my kids are fighting. And I, you know, so it's like, what am I? Anyway, so there's that. But uh, she's, she's, Baruch Hashem, look. Thank you, Harasho, Slava Bogu. Thank you, Hashem, for the blessings in my life. 
for my Asia Israel wife. <laughs> I, c- I can imagine on the flip side of that also there's the travel in a normal world, obviously not, not right now, but the travel, and especially around the Yom Tov season, Pesach, you, you're not with your family, Chalmai, Sukkot. Yeah. People, people yeah. Tip, a typical from person, like, oh, Yom Tov's coming up. I'm going right. to relax. I'm when gonna... everybody's on vacation, you're... we're working. Yeah, that's difficult. You have to carve out uh, vacation time. So like the, yeah, like exactly. The, the best times for singers is the three weeks. Yeah. Now it's our, you know, that's what, oh, Bach Hashem, Sasimchen Shtub. Three weeks and then the Svira Soimer, you know what I mean, between Rosh Chaydesh and Lag Boimer, you know. You have to figure it out. Yeah, it's, it's look, but, but from the other side, we are home a lot more, right? Even uh, we get to sleep uh, pretty late, but uh, we're home. You're not, uh, on a, a lot of people work in a warehouse or whatever it is. They get up in the morning, they're out of the house six o'clock in the morning. And they don't come home till nine o'clock at night. And uh, you know what I mean? They see their kids, uh, Shabbos, I guess they see their kids. Right. Do you love what you do? Do you, uh, do you ever, you ever sitting in an airport in like Nashville and you're like, what am I doing? Oh this yeah. Is... Yeah. Sometimes. Yeah. You do, you get down on yourself to some of those sure. times? Sure. Sometimes it gets very difficult. Sometimes you're tired. Sometimes you have a headache. Sometimes you're, you're sick. Getting sick is the most stressful thing. Getting sick before it's a like show. You have a job. Well, have what a bracha show? does a singer get that they get like they get minimal amount of colds per year? It is so difficult. It is so stressful. It is so stressful. I mean, I don't know. For I find from for me, it's the most stressful. That's why they're always wearing scarves. You guys are always, you know, professional singers yeah. are always wearing scarves. <laughs> yeah, if they take it seriously. It is. I don't know. Look, look, because when you're sick, also everything is schwacher. Your tolerance for stress is weaker so for me i don't know that's just very very difficult getting sick on the road you're not home you don't have your medicine cabinet you don't have your hot water machine you don't have your everything you don't whatever but look i love it i love the i love singing i love music and i love traveling so uh pretty good thank god my blessings a typical chabasker I don't know if I said that properly. Almost. Chabad stir? Chabad. Skr? A person who's Lubavitch <laughs> typically Chabad deals with... Chabad that's a good one. He, he, they deal with people who are either not religious or people who are Lubavitch. You specifically kind of deal with all types of Jews, whether Lubavitch, from, not from, a, all types. What's, what's that like? Was, was there an adjustment for you? Because there's, there's a different vibe that Chabad has from Litvish from Hasidish to Sfardi? Um, interesting. Good question. Thank you, your there, brother. Yeah. <laughs> there was, there, I, think, I think there was an adjustment, um, although there really shouldn't have been. But I think there was. I think the, the idea is, what's, I mean, why, why, why is Chabad working with Jews who, 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 are, who are very different from the way that they are? Is because th- there's a strong emphasis on Avas Yisrael. And on, on 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 being available for your fellow Jew, um, it it was never meant. I don't think, at least, it was never meant to be specifically for Jews who are not religious. It was meant to be for your fellow Jew. Uh, and what if he's religious? So even him. <laughs> as funny as that sounds. Um, so it shouldn't have been a, 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 a an adjustment. But I guess because I mean, yeah, it is. It's it, it's a it's a culture shock. There are certain things that are like such a given um, in Chabad that are so foreign and different Kreisen or the opposite the other way around. I remember talking years ago, a bunch of Bachram and they mentioned, I don't know, maybe the name of a, a certain Rashi Shiva that I didn't, I didn't recognize. And they said to me, hey, oh, we're going to learn by you. What's his name? Whatever. And, and I guess my face didn't register uh, recognition. And they're like, you, you don't know, you don't, you don't know who he is. Like they looked at me like I was from another planet. And I thought to myself, uh, how am I supposed to know who this guy is? I like mean, he's I Rav Chaim Kanievsky. How do you not know who he <laughs> exactly. is? No, so like I said, I said like I said some name from Chabad, like Rabbi El Khan. I said, you guys know what Rabbi El Khan is? <laughs> no, of course not. So why are you expecting right. me to know? So it was a little bit of that. But uh, whatever, it's a klinikite. I mean, we, we get along. I mean, for the most part. What do, you the mean most for, part. what do you mean for the most part? For the most part, I mean when 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 people you know it's happened to me at weddings where people get on on get you know 
you know, the Lubavitcher menorah that they put on the car. It's not a kosher menorah, blah, blah, blah. Like, they come at what? you? Yeah. You're like, I'm just singing. What is what's going no, on? No, like, why are you starting up with me? Why, 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 like, I don't know you. Right. Why are you being so aggressive in our very, very first meeting ever? Right. Let's see. That's, that's, that's probably like... Because they feel like they know you. They, they watch hours yes, of videos yeah. of you. And 17 like, million people are about to just jump right. down your throat. <laughs> it's funny because I even feel not enough to like get in a fight you because I just... That's not... I don't think the right or normal thing to do. I can't but wait. I, I can't I wait for what I feel like say. I know you in a certain way and, and you're like looking at me and you even... You sing by my wedding, but you're like looking at me like, hey, you're another person and hey, I, you have that friendly look to me, but... I'm looking at you like I know you, and you're like I don't really know you. Right. Um, That's true. I guess so. You're right. But I, I, you know, I always have this policy. I'm not taking criticism from anybody unless they start out with a compliment. Say something nice. The first thing you say to me has to be something nice. And then if you want to you wanna criticize, I'll, I'm open to it. The first thing out of your mouth can't be, Hurr! That's very nice of you, though, because, like, I, I don't know, like, even, even if they start off with something nice and then they say something negative, you don't feel like, okay, maybe there's truth to it, but you don't know me. You don't know what I'm going through. That's, and, and that might be my response. That might be my response, ultimately. But at least, you know, right, whatever. Now we're having nice. a conversation. Mm. Now we're talking. If you start out right away, Guns blazing. We're not yeah. even talking. You just you just attacking me, and I don't know who you are. And and in another minute, I'm I'm not gonna be talking to you. Right. And it's again, <laughs> my life is gonna move forward and, and garnish. Like it was, I don't know what the reason for this interaction is even. Anyway, so I I I, I heard that your your niece got married in Lakewood. Um, two nieces. You got two uh, two nieces yeah, got two married in Lakewood. Yeah. And and there was I guess a bunch of yeshiva guys that heard about it, uh-huh. and they went to the uh-huh. wedding. Can you tell us about? Oh, so what happened was my CD, Ivri Anoichi, right? Fill the world with light. I think, um, I think my niece got married on a Monday and the CD was going to be released Tuesday or Wednesday. And on Sunday, my father called me and said, why don't you give out the CD at the wedding? Like a uh, chura, a momento. And I didn't have CDs ready, so I called this like little print house in Manhattan or something like that, and asked them if they can print, I don't know, 500 pieces. Not, you know, no jacket, no fancy cover, just a CD in a little plastic sleeve and give them out. So I got like 500 copies for Monday, fast, uh, fast uh, turnaround. We started giving them out. At the end of the wedding, we, so we gave them out as, uh, you know, and next door is a yeshiva. And somehow they found out that we're giving out CDs. Oh, Jews and yeah. Jews and the free word. Oh man, they're in. <laughs> that was new music, right? And, you know, and we, and we were giving it out. So yeah, so I, I, I would go. send it on that wedding. And uh, at a certain point, there was no more CDs, and Bachum were still coming, and they were, and they were very uh, clear about what they wanted. You know, <laughs> they walk inside and they go, well, "What's going on? What are you looking for?" Uh, someone's giving out CDs. <laughs> <laughs> It was funny. It was a it was a funny. The legend has it though that you just danced with them the whole night until. Yeah, we had a great. But time. you didn't stop them. You're just like, let's go, let's dance, yeah. let's party. That's very nice. Yeah. Well, we were in a festive mood, right? <laughs> so switching gears a bit, I remember seeing a video not too long ago, maybe a couple of years ago. I believe you were in Alabama by a wedding, and you uh-huh. were going crazy on stage. You were you were jumping up and down to the point where I think. Uh, he does that always, the, but this time... No, really the musicians were like, so. yo, Benny, relax. Yeah. What, what happened that night that... It was my niece's wedding. Yeah. It was in Alabama? Zoe's Hanukkah in Alabama, Birmingham, Alabama. My brother lives in Birmingham. And I was... I, I, again, I was sick. Really? Yeah, I had a terrible cold. And the musician is my friend, Honey Malecki. And I said to him earlier in the day, I'm not going to be able to sing tonight. So whatever, my brother will sing, my nephews will sing, whatever. There's, there's no shortage of it's singers. It's good when it happens to, us, to a family member's yeah. wedding. Thank God, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, Baruch <laughs> Hashem. No stress. I just said, I can't do it tonight. That's all. And uh, he said, okay, no problem. Then at the, at the Kabbalah Sponim, oh man, this was the greatest day ever. At the Kabbalah Sponim, everyone's like, the Kabbalah Spun was in the Chabad house, right? And the chuppah was going to be outside the Chabad house. And then the reception was down the block in a bigger hall. So we're all in the Chabad house and just cake and cookies and a little bit of uh, alcohol. Say so l'chaim, not a lot. 
And suddenly, like, people are whispering and hushing and shushking, and everyone's checking their phone and lo- lo- looking around like, what's going on? And it's like a rumor started that Sholmar Herobashkin, something about Sholmar Herobashkin, he's out, he's getting out, he's coming out. Trump said something, he signed something. A bunch of rumors, right? And everybody's not sure if we are so nobody believing wants to this. Say something, no, right? yeah, it, it's too good to just jump on this news. Anyway, suddenly a WhatsApp message came out. My friend Shmuli Rubashkin, Shomorche's son, where he's like crying, hysterical, happy tears, screaming, it's true. The rumors are true. And my father's out and he's on the way out. My mother's on the, my mother's on the way now to over there to pick him up. And it was just the place exploded. Now, in Chabad House, you have the, the, the family, all the, all the Froom guys who are checking the WhatsApp messages, and then you have the local Birmingham people who are just here for a, yeah. <laughs> a, a party that they, you know. And suddenly, like in a second, the whole thing exploded, like it, everything changed. Suddenly, everyone's, you know, grabbing each other, hugging, kissing, drinking, saying L'chaim. Uh, one of my brothers looked at the table right away and said, just not enough l'chaim. He, <laughs> he ran right away down the block right before the stores can close. And Khani Maleki, the musician, called me. He was already down at the hall and he called me and he said, I don't care if you have a cold. I don't care about nothing. Shalom Mordechai is free. You're going to sing. Anyway, by the time we got to the uh, hall, it was... And, uh, and it was just... For you personally, though, there's there's more to it. Why why were you particularly more excited than the average person? Um, I spent three years in Postville. I spent three years in Postville. Two of them I spent in where Rabat. He was there in Postville when you were there. I lived in his house. You lived in his house. Wow. Uh, so first of all, before he moved to Postville, he when they opened up the the company in there, he didn't move his family right away to Postville. He moved his family to St. Paul, Minnesota. He lived down the block. Uh, oh, I know four that. or five houses down from us and he used to commute he would go uh, whatever he, it's not far it's like two and a half hour drive and so his kids are, were always in our house we were always in their house my 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 father and, and he are best friends this is already going back 30 years and then when he moved to Postville then he started a yeshiva I went to yeshiva there and I lived in his house I was a Ben Bias over there for two years and he strongly encouraged my singing Really, he uh, he ha- he hosted every Matzah Shabbos and Malav Malka for the whole community. Every Matzah Shabbos, everyone came to his house, and they had a big Malav Malka. And I and he would Benny Benny sing sing a good sing, and uh, every Matzah Shabbos, like that's really where I. There's a video of you singing for him. Yeah, Lag Boimer in the backyard. So he he pushed you to yeah get in very this. much so. He, he pushed me. He encouraged, he encouraged me. Very yeah, yeah. In, in I was into way. it. I was not. Right, right, I, yeah, I, yeah. No, I, no, he didn't force you. Yeah. Not, I mean, pushed like an encouraging no, I, I wasn't. I, I didn't resist. I was scared, wit, you know, witless, or whatever the expression is. But uh, he pushed and he, he, he encouraged and he, you know, go up to be the chaz and go, you're gonna, we're going we're gonna to bring a musician and you're going to sing. He was very, very supportive. Um, and I went up to over there to uh, prison a couple of times when he was there and, and like... And then, right? And then when he when he came out, and it was it was like a, a shock, like a surprise. I mean, like like a, a, a little bit of of what it will be like when Mashiach comes. Like we're all just going to be sitting around doing whatever we're in the middle of doing, and suddenly it's going to be like, wait, <laughs> check the WhatsApp, get a confirmation. Are you serious? What's going on? Like it was. That's what it felt like. So Yeshiva world is gonna like break Mashiach, like they're gonna like break yeah, the news. Uh, some someone's Ma, going to. Go. Right? Mashiach is gonna I show am, up. It's interesting. Yeah, I don't know who's gonna. It's gonna be interesting. <laughs> Whatever. However, it's gonna be. It's gonna be like that. Right. Like, are, are you? Are you, you sure? Here? Come on. Is Did this you, real no, or is this be. fake? You know, like, that's it's something that you're, like, you're wishing for every day. Like you have this low grade stress about like what is this happening already, and like it's always sitting there, and like suddenly, whew, right? That uh, is is this happening right now? Like is it? Is this, is this real? real? Right. Oh, yeah. How do, who, 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 who could confirm this? Like, who do I have to call right now? Uh, you know? And a voice note from like, Dabba 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 comes yeah. <laughs> I'm putting this on my status. Um, very cool. Something I'm very curious, and I, I'm sure, I'm curious with every singer. Do you have a, a pressure to stay relevant? Is that, is that, and it could be a, too much of a personal question, but 
like relevant in my personal no, like, life? Just, no, just like, <laughs> <laughs> no, but like music. singing. Yeah, I mean, I have a terrible voice, um, but I'm still going to go into music. Yeah, I can go. But, Come on. Me out there. That was beautiful. Thank you. He said, you're show, my, <laughs> Benny, you're my <laughs> Donny Gross. And, See you that? know, um, but I'm always, I, I think it's just a scary profession to get into because there's people, especially now, people are so like, oh, I'm into this, now I'm into that. Are, are, is that a pressure for you to, to be there? Um, yeah. Yeah, of course. But I was listening once to one of Shmuley Marcus's songs that he recorded after he recorded Yalili, which became a, a Lahit Hysteri. And in one of the songs he recorded afterwards, he hit one of the lines is, don't let the hits hit you over the head. Hmm. Right? When you have a hit song, you can become paralyzed because now you're starting, you start thinking, how, how do I replicate that? Or how can I compete with that? Or is my best work behind me? Like all these things that, that mess with your head. And you have to consciously try to push those thoughts away and say, all you can do is, is do the best that you can do and hope, hope that it works out. And as far as staying current, that's a little more difficult because, because it has to be natural to you what you're doing. And if you're chasing somebody else's style, let's say, that he does very well and he does very naturally, and you do it less well and less naturally, you, you're, you, you, it's not going to work. Um, even, even you notice, I mean, I don't know, what, like Avram Fried. Um, I know watching him when Yalili was super popular, he wouldn't sing it. He wouldn't, he wouldn't sing. Maybe today he sings it a little bit, but then he wouldn't sing it. And they're also his nephews. They're his nephews, sure. But like, he, he looked at the song and, he's, and he saw it and he goes, this song doesn't, it doesn't resonate in my bones. Like, I can't, I can't. It's can't not see, me. It's not me. Can't see him singing and if I, song. Yeah, right? It's not his song. It's not, it's not. If he, if he would sing it, it wouldn't work. Right? I did a thing with him with, at, at Camp Simcha and they were singing, we were on the stage together and they said, sing Yesh Tikva. Right? So sing Yesh Tikva. I say, I he sang Yesh Tikva. Sing Ivri Anoichi. He tells me, Ben, <laughs> all yours. You know, it's Yesh Tikva. I, I, I'm down with that song. That works for me. Ivri Anoichi. Like he's very, he knows what, what his lane is, where, you, where he's, what he does and what he doesn't do. And a lot of guys are confused about what they do and what they don't do. They try this and they try that. And, it's, and, so, and if you, you do something that's not... It's not. It's not native to you, to your or whatever. It doesn't work. I love the theme that we're talking about because I think the. I don't. We don't know our audience so well, but exactly what you're saying. They're not all singers, but what you're saying is a life lesson for literally everything and anything just in life about being true to ourselves and being being us. And sometimes there are opportunities to jump into someone else's thing, and it's not really us. Yeah. And uh, people. You know, sometimes make it, sometimes don't make it. I saw, I saw an interview. I saw an interview with um, Warren Buffett and I think Jay-Z with Forbes magazine. And the guy who's doing the interview says to, uh, says to uh, Warren Buffett, do you have any advice for this young entrepreneur? And he gives him whatever thing. And then, and then he says, um, Jay-Z, do you have advice for... Warren Buffett, Buffett. Yeah. and Jay Z says, "I'm going to stay in my lane." <laughs> Warren Buffett is a genius businessman, billionaire, trillionaire. I'm, I'm not going to sit here and think to myself, "I can give him advice." Like it was a very, he knew it was a very place. appropriate answer. Like, right. yeah, wow, I'm going to give you advice. Now, what, am I crazy? Right. I don't give you give me advice. I don't give you advice. This is a, we. I know my place, and you know your place, and then, then let's leave it at that. As as we wrap up, we have uh, we're tumor- wrapping up. I'm, okay, well, well, fill in. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay, yeah. Um, just because I said Jay Z doesn't mean to start wrapping. <laughs> no, up. hello. We could. We we just know you have a Zoom call. Ironically, no. Actually, I just I just signed on. I just opened up my phone back again to see if uh, if I'm getting uh, hacked about it. But they actually told me it's better if I do it at three o'clock. 
Okay. Great. So now so, I got extra time. Okay. So, so a question that we like to ask our guests, I like to ask it. Now he doesn't like to ask it. No, no, no. I don't do you, not like to ask it. Just some of the responses are better than the others. So let's see. We'll see how you feel. All great responses. Do you have a favorite mitzvah that resonates with you? There's no wrong answer. <laughs> Favorite mitzvah, yeah. Um, and if you don't like that, we can ask you your favorite avera. I have a a, a, a favorite, like a, a favorite set of mitzvahs: um, uh, leket, shikha, and peah. Like whenever I plow my field, <laughs> you're trolling. And I forget <laughs> the straw in the corner. I love to leave it for the right. poor, for the for the poor people. I love that mitzvah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a favorite mitzvah? I don't know. I mean. Uh, Stomps Simchas Chosen Kala Yeah Okay I don't Pretty know good. That well That I is mean, a lot a, of what you do It's a lot of what I do um, That's a good one Do you prefer to sing by a wedding Than by a concert No No Prefer, I prefer a wedding a, I prefer a concert You prefer a concert Okay Why Yeah why is that I feel like at a wedding You are an accessory in a in a in an event. So there's the flowers and there's the catering. Flops, no, is yeah, the exact eye. And there's the music and there's and you're and you're part of the music and there's a wedding going on mm-hmm. and you stand on the side and you you uh, send in good energy into that party. Um, which might be a mistake. I know a lot of singers are very good at like when they come into the room this is my party, and I'm running this party. I have a hard time with that. I don't know. Mid uh, site, I'll probably get better at it. If Hashem of Tabish helps, but the meanwhile, it's very much there's a family simcha going on, right? And if and if the Hassan's uh, brother-in-law wants to sing me Adir, I I get the fact that that's much more sentimental. Value mm-hmm. than if I sing it. If I'll sing it, I'm a professional and blah blah blah. But if he sings it, you know, I'll make the bubba cry. So there's that going on. I'm an I'm 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 an, an add-on to a party. At a concert, there's a personal connection going on here. Like you you have more of that freedom and that opportunity to say, Come, let me take you on a journey somewhere and we'll communicate for a while. At a wedding, it's you don't want to. I feel like you don't want to take too much, right? You don't want to take too the much. The show's not attention. about you; it's right. about the uh, chasen kala, right? So, so people people are listening to this whenever they listen to this podcast. But obviously, over the last few months, things have been different: concerts, weddings, and you have done a couple of concerts that is basically you with the green screens all around you, and you're singing to tens of thousands of people, and you have this insane energy, and a lot of the performers do. How do you get yourself to that place when you're literally in front of five people with a camera and just green screens? How do you get yourself to that place of like you're singing in front of so many people? You have to uh, crank up the volume on your on your monitors, <laughs> get that music pumping, and uh, and and just be conscious of the fact that there are people watching. Uh, it's not. Uh, it's 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 different. It's much different from being in a live environment, but it's not so difficult. You pump up the volume, you jump up and down a couple of times before the, the camera turns on, and you, uh, you just go. And, and, and you just have to tell yourself. You know, it's like, oh, I have a hard time. A lot of guys are good on, on Insta stories, right? They, 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 you know, they're walking through an airport or, uh, or uh, you're walking down <laughs> Central Avenue, they're like, what's up? And you go, oh my gosh, well, you're not so, uh, so you know, self-conscious. I think to myself always, like, I'm much more self-conscious about the seven people who are here at this uh, gate at the airport watching me do this than about the 20,000 people who are going to watch the story. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't know why. That's a weird thing. But I, I can't, I can't, But some people are very natural with it. They pull out the phone and they go, this is what I do. Bah, 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 bah. And they're in. They're, you know, they turn it on and they got the energy up high. And, that's, and, and so I do that. I don't, I can't, I'm not so good at doing it here, but I can do it. You put me in, a, in an environment with some... Music pumping, some cake. Give me a, give me a, something to eat, <laughs> something to drink, and you and you go. It's not, it's not, uh, it's not. Loy uh, it's doable. You just. This is the first time we've done an interview that we literally had 
people ask if they could come watch the interview. We have a live live studio I'm audience. I'm tell you, I've never seen two more well-behaved kids <laughs> for like an hour. These are not one sound. For those listening, they don't see this. That Nachi's nephews are in the room, and we actually have a question from Nachi's nephew that he'd like to ask you. Uh, Nissan, could you go up to the on, mic? Nissan. I just want to say these are my cousins. Yeah, there's there's tons of uh, yeah. family relationships going on. Yeah, here. yeah. So Nissan has a, has a question. When did the singing thing all begin? Like like uh, generations? Like um, Oof, which, person? which person? Which person? That's a good question. I don't know exactly. I don't know exactly. I know. I'll tell you a couple of stories. One is that uh, the legend goes that my grandmother's father came home from shul one day in Tashkent, in Russia, and said to his daughter, who is my grandmother, I heard a Balkaira in shul today. What a beautiful kriya. I think we should make a shidduch. <laughs> that's, what, that's a story that I heard about my grandfather leaning in shul in Tashkent. Another story that I heard was about my grandfather's grandfather. Okay, so that's my, that's actually who I'm named after, Ben Sian. My, my father's 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 father. You're keeping up. <laughs> <laughs> that he was the Baltfila for on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur by the Belushevi Rebbe, by the Tzvila Tzadik. So it's been a, a singing or davening, uh, Baltfila, Balkoira, has been in the family for a, for a long time. Um, when did we start making money on it? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, for, that's for the next uh, podcast that we did right. with you. Um, last question we want to ask you um, for a, someone young out there who's thinking about getting into music. They're, they're, they have a great voice. They... they like the industry they like what it does what advice would you give to them if you could like speak to them when you speak you know as if you're talking to them right now in front yeah, of you yeah you look at the camera and hello <laughs> nah. um I, I don't know man it's tough you need you need to you need to have thick skin you need to be prepared to try something that could either succeed or fail and you're going to be trying it in front of everybody. So it's very difficult. You just need to have thick skin because everybody has an opinion and everybody's going to share their opinion with you. And that's fine. You just have to be uh, thick skinned about it. Not let, not let uh, negative uh, feedback or negative energy affect you or hurt you or bring you down because I see, I see it a lot. Even people who are who are successful or somewhat successful, negative feedback is like poison, and it hurts. You have to have a lot of you have to have a toughness about you, where you know what you're doing and you know what you're trying to do, and you focus and don't let anybody, uh, like we said earlier, pull you in, in in directions that you that's not your direction. Um, also, you need to drink a lot of water. <laughs> And you need to, you need to be true to your kishkes. You need to, you need to know your style. You need to know what you're good at, and you need to know what you're not good at. And try to stay away from those things that you're not good at, and, try, and stick with the things that you are good at. And surround yourself by by people who know how to bring out the best in you. And um, and also have a lot of disposable money. I mean, it's very expensive. <laughs> Disposable it's money. A, it's a very Start saving up now. For these, yeah, yeah. And, and not a lot of financial return in it. It's a crazy business model. And even the successful ones, uh, like the math doesn't really work. That's basically, <laughs> <laughs> it's a wacky business model. It's not the best business model to be in if you, I mean, look, there's a lot of businesses that you can go into um, to make money. This is a business that you go into because you have no choice. You are a singer, and nobody can stop you, and you just do it because you have it in your blood, and you have to do it. You don't, it's not a choice. If it's a choice, you think it to yourself, you know what, I could go into, uh, I could study law, or I could study voice. What should it be? 
study law. <laughs> but if it, you have no choice, um, then just give it all you got. Don't uh, listen to, hey, yeah, you're yeah, paying attention. <laughs> don't listen to uh, the the negative, uh, yeah, don't listen to after law, it's all the hate. And, uh, and that's it. Bimeretz, mitoich meretz, ubitoch in chazak. Work as hard as you can, schwitz a little bit, and believe that Hashem will, will, uh, will guide you down the right path. If it's this, it will be this, and if it's uh, not this, it will be something else. Benny Freeman, thank you so much for coming. Thanks for coming. Really appreciate by, it. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Meaningful People podcast with Benny Freeman. We sure did. We had a great time sitting down and getting to know a little bit more about him. What you guys don't know actually is after we shut the cameras and mics off, Benny used our studio to partake in a Zoom wedding slash party um, for a chassan in Maine. And and Ma- it wasn't just a chassan. Chassan and in Maine in Moscow. So we, we do have some uh, footage. You can yeah. head over to our Instagram page, Meaningful People Podcast on Instagram to see some behind the scenes footage of Benny singing some of his songs to our computer. I don't know if m- most people know this, but you're like cousins with him, right? You're related. To yeah, him. We're, we're related um, to my father's side. And it's funny because he did sing by my wedding, but I didn't know anything about him. For example, like when he came in here, I'm like, wow, his Sphira beard is so big. Yeah, that's and not I quickly, a Sphira beard. <laughs> I quickly learned he is uh, Lubavitch, so. He is, he is. And as you guys know through this episode, he's got some yichas, especially in the, in the music world. You know, Alvin Fried's his uncle, Eighth Day is his, are his cousins. Eighth, uh, the other Ellie Marcus is his cousin as well. They are, his family is responsible for a huge chunk of the Jewish, of Jewish music. So we think that's pretty meaningful. It's meaningful. And, and I, I like that the lessons that we learned, which is as we're, we kept on saying it throughout the episode that, wow, this applies. I have to be myself, to be true to myself. I have to push through I have to not listen to the haters that is such a good lesson just for right. everyone and, and he uh, and especially the part where he mentions how he took his career you know to a whole next level from just pushing his voice and when it got tough when it gets hard in that and in the, in the, with those keys in the range you just push it four steps higher and he completely changed his, his career and took it to a whole new level I think there's a lot to learn from that even if you're not in the Jewish music world no matter what you're doing I think there's um, something meaningful to, to derive from that Get ready for some awesome episodes coming up, and we'll see you next time.